Great. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I don't have a nice uh, PowerPoint like uh, Nikolai did. Um, just sort of a, a PDF handout of, it's pretty much just an abridged version of the paper. And there's a lot here. Um, so it, it might be a good, a good thing that I got a little extra time, um, but I'll still try to be brief where I can. So the paper is mostly about um, a sort of view about how we refer to abstract objects, a view due to Linsky and Zalta uh, that relies on definite descriptions. So I called it descriptivism. Um, it's primary, I mean, you know, it's about abstract objects in general, but um, the way the sort of dialectic has gone in other papers and as well as this presentation, it's mostly on mathematical objects. So I'll mostly talk about mathematical objects as well. So what they call their theory, um, well, before I get into that, let me give a quick roadmap of what's going to happen. First, I'm going to describe um, their theory, um, their descriptivism uh, in the guise of their object theory. Uh, then I'm going to describe the critiques or, or a critique of their object theory from a philosopher named uh, Stefan Boijman. Then I want to talk about Lenski and Zalta's 2019 reply paper to Boijman, and then that will provide uh, what I need, the resources I need to talk about uh, the critiques, the, the problems I want to present for their view. And then the last section, I'll try to um, provide on their behalf a way of responding to the problems I'm going to raise. I don't think uh, those solutions will ultimately work, but I'm still working through some of that. Um, maybe there are ways to save their view. I kind of would like to save it if I could. Um, but anyway, let me talk about what their view actually is now. So yeah, they call it object theory. And um, it's supposed to do a lot. Um, one big thing it's supposed to do is solve the Banasaraf worry, the one that's the worry about referential access or cognitive access is how Sam Cowling puts it, uh, re referential or cognitive access to abstract objects. Um, they also think it will solve other problems, but that's the main thing. Uh, so they argue that object theory gives them the resources to claim that we can have day ray beliefs, knowledge, reference, and acquaintance with mathematical objects. Okay. So there's three axioms to this. Some symbols are sort of weird here, um, but that's just copy and paste to Google Docs. This is the same box operator um, we all know and love, and there should be a diamond right here. It disappeared, and this is just a biconditional arrow. I'll explain what the axioms mean in a second. Um, but this predicate, A exclamation point X, asserts that X is abstract. And then little x capital F, that's different from what you normally see in formal logic, right? Normally you would see the F first and the X second to say something like X is a frog. Um, this little notational thing is Linsky and Zalta's way of saying that uh, X encodes the property of being F, where encoding is sort of a primitive for this system, but it's different from the normal sort of predicate predication of it, of what they call exemplification. So when we say X is a frog, um, we're saying X exemplifies frogness. But if we have this, we're saying the object X encodes the property of being a frog. And this is something special to abstract objects. Abstract objects encode. Okay, maybe more will come up, up on that later, but that's the basics. Um, so what do the axioms say? The first axiom is sort of their comprehension principle. It gets them to the sort of metaphysics they want. It says, uh, for every condition on properties, there's an abstract individual that encodes exactly the properties satisfying the condition. So that's gonna give you a plenitude of abstracta. You're gonna get an abstract object for any combination of encodings whatsoever, encodings of properties. So a plenitude, right? Like plenitudinous Platonism, if, if that rings a bell. Um, the second axiom where this box is missing it says that uh, if X possibly encodes a property, then it encodes the property uh, necessarily. So that's gonna give you the necessary existence of abstracta. And then the third axiom uh, is just the identity conditions for them. If uh, two abstract objects uh, encode the exact same properties, then that's, that's the same abstract object. Okay. Uh, this is just building up the view so we can uh, get to the, the problems. Um, propositions are treated as zero place properties for them. So what this means, um, and they're explicit about this, uh, theories are abstract objects, according to them. 
uh, a theory T is an abstract object that encodes just the propositions asserted by T. Uh, and then they add this little bit. They say, let K be any constant or complex term in the language of theory T. Then we say that the mathematical object K of the theory T, it's K sub T, is that abstract object that encodes just the properties F such that in theory T, K sub T exemplifies F. So for example, the number one of PNO number theory is the abstract object that encodes exactly those properties it exemplifies in P and T. Okay. Um, that should definitely become clear later if it isn't already. Um, but this is the key. Um, once we get that little thing on board, uh, they think we have a pretty clear way of how we have uh, referential access or how we can refer to uh, mathematical objects. Uh, we do it via definite descriptions of the following kind. And here's some more formal logic. Um, it's just a definite description. This is the IOTA operator, I think from Russell, uh, the unique Y such that Y is abstract and Y encodes all the properties um, that uh, the theory says K sub T does. Um, we can ignore the formal logic if we want to. Basically, it's saying to refer to the number one of piano number theory, at least this is what they're saying in 1995, to refer to the one of piano number theory, we must use a definite description that picks out the unique abstract object that encodes all the properties that one does according to piano number theory. Okay. In 2017, Stefan Boijman has a really good paper. And more or less, his primary question is like, okay, great theory, Linsky and Zalta, but how do sort of normal people refer to numbers all the time, right? Uh, normal people aren't using these sort of formal logic constructions, yet we should say that normal people can talk about the number two. Um, that's more or less, I think, the gist of his paper, but th there's more going on there. Uh, he raises the question, what exactly is needed to successfully employ the definite description to refer to mathematical objects? Which I think is a way of asking the question I just described in a different way. Um, he offers two answers to it. I don't want to discuss both. I just want to mention one possible answer to this question is what he calls the weaker answer. And it says, all we need to know in order to effectively refer to the mathematical objects via the mathematical descriptions, all we need to know is a few of the core or essential properties that K sub T encodes according to the theory T. Uh, and Boijman finds two faults with even this weaker answer. The second I'm not gonna talk about, but the first is important because I think it's a problem that still lingers on uh, for Linsky and Zalta. The first problem is that people who lived before piano number theory was a, a established theory could not have revert, referred to the natural number one. Uh, since on this interpretation, one still needs to know the properties of one according to P and T in order to refer, um, th so those who lived before the development of PNT did not refer to the same number one that we do. I think this is a really deep problem for their view, for Linsky and Zalta's view. And when I get to the critical section, section four of the presentation today, I want to say, look, Linsky and Zalta did not satisfactory, uh, they didn't come up with a satisfactory uh, solution to this problem in their 2019 response to Boijman. Uh, and in fact, I think the way that they respond to Boijman in this 2019 paper just makes the, this, this specific problem deeper for themselves. And I'll explain that soon when we get to section four. Let me now talk about this specific 2019 response paper to Boijman. Um, I think their view is very much more fleshed out there and worth examining. Um, yeah. So they're, they're, this paper, a lot of it is devoted to answering that core question Boijman raised. Um, what exactly is needed to successfully employ the definite descriptions to refer to mathematical objects? And they're specifically attuned to wondering with Boijman about how lay people can refer to the number two without using those sort of, you know, technical definite descriptions. Um, so let's just begin there with their discussion of how lay people refer to mathematical objects. This is what they say. The use of a mathematical term by a lay person is acquired through a causal chain that traces back to the community of mathematicians and the use of the term by the person in question thereby depends on the use of the term by mathematicians. So what I think is going on here is a sort of semantic deference picture, the sort of thing that you find in uh, 70s Burge and Putnam um, where they discuss like arthritis is the classic example, but um, how non-experts can refer to the thing 
experts are referring to without knowing all the technical details uh, because they sort of defer, they semantically defer to the experts. Um, so Linsky and Zalta call this, they, they call this, where the lay people are referring to the numbers, uh, they call this uh, the derivative case of mathematical reference. In derivative reference, the person in question uses a mathematical term K with the intention to refer to whatever the mathematicians refer to. Um, mathematical experts, in this case, then take the lead role in the linguistic division of labor. Just citing Putnam there, okay. So cool, that's how lay people refer to the numbers, but you see how it depends on the experts. So let's turn to non-derivative reference then. Let's see how the mathematicians, the actual experts refer to the number one. Number one is just my running case study, but we could pick any mathematical object. Um, so Linsky and Zalta say, if T, the theory, is a consistent theory and S, a subject, knows only that K is a well-defined term of T, then S can use K to successfully refer. This does not require that S be able to give a T-based description of what K denotes. So the mathematician doesn't have to get a very in-depth explanation. They don't have to know the intimate details of what the theory says about number one, say. They just only need to know that the number one, that's our example, is a well-defined term of piano number theory. So that's what I have here. It seems that to refer to one, the expert must employ the term one in some way. And also the expert must know that, what, what must they know? They must know that one is a well-defined term of PNT, this italicized thing. Okay. So what does it take to know that one is a well-defined term of PNT? But PNT is just piano number theory. Um, so here's something I think, I think everybody might agree. Um, I think to know that P is a Q, one must be able to refer to both P and Q, right? To know that the mug is on the table, you need to be able to refer to that mug and that table. Eh, that seems generally true. Um, so this means for the expert to know that one is a well-defined term of P and T, the expert must be able to refer to the term one and the theory P and T. Uh, the term one is not a problem. I'm gonna assume that we can successfully refer to terms, but we should focus on what it, what it takes to refer to the theory P and T, okay? So recall that theories on this view we're looking at for Linsky and Zalta, that is, theories are themselves abstract objects. It seems to refer to the one of P and T, the expert must know that one is a well-defined term of P and T, I've said that already, but to know this requires the ability to reference P and T, I've said that already, so the question of reference to the natural number one, both in the layperson case and in the mathematician case, it has now become a question of how the mathematical experts are supposed to be able to refer to the theory P and T. Okay, so what do Linsky and Zalta say about references to theories like P and T? Earlier in the same paper that I've been talking about, they say, as long as the person, and here the person they have in mind is an expert, as long as the person uses the name of T to identify the theory in question, the causal chain of reference tra traces back to the first use of the name T to introduce the theory. So putting some pieces together here, when an expert has knowledge that one is a well-defined term of P and T, the expert can reference P and T by virtue of another different semantic deference chain now that goes back to the authors of the theory. That's not what's literally said in this quote, but they spend a lot of time right after this quote talking about authors and the way I'm about to describe. So I'm being a little charitable here and, and, and ignoring just the, the, the act of naming the theory T and talking about authorship. I, I think that's fine. Um, so now, right, our even layperson uh, reference to numbers, it's, it's all a matter of this authorship business. So here's what Linsky and Zalta uh, claim about mathematical theory authorship. We rely on the fact that reference traces back by way of causal chains. In ordinary, that is non-mathematical and non-fictional cases, the beginning of the chain is a baptism of ordinary object, whereas in mathematical cases, the beginning of the chain is a theory in the context of which unique abstract objects are denoted given our analysis. Instead of a baptism of a concrete object, someone authors a theory. So just summing up here, lay people rely on the reference chain to experts who in turn rely on a different reference chain to authors. So the question of how anyone at all refers to mathematical objects depends on this authoring business. Okay. Now I wanna to get to the sort of title problems, the title of the talk, the, the, the problems for the view. Um, 
The first one is really just the point, the problem Boijman already identified. And if anyone here is Dutch, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Boijman, I don't know. But um, I just want to point out in this section, uh, in this first half of this section, that um, Linsky and Zalta's 2019 view that I just described with authors and all this makes Boijman's original worry even worse. Okay. So let me explain why. For Linsky and Zalta, lay people, uh, this is summary again, lay people refer to the familiar natural number one of P and T by a semantically different chain of reference traceable to the experts. And the experts refer to one via reference to P and T and their reference to P and T is secured by a chain of reference traceable to the authors of P and T. Okay, so here's what this implies for Linsky and Zalta's account. No one at all referred to the natural number one before Dedekind and Piano developed P and T. Or maybe they could get away with saying, People did refer to some numbers or some number similar to the one of P and T in various respects, maybe. But when people before Dedekind and Piano uttered natural language locutions of the form one, they just could not have referred to the very same object we refer to when we make those same natural language locutions. On Linsky and Zalta's view, all current reference to one bottoms out in the authoring of P and T. So everyone before that either referred to no numbers at all in their natural number language discourse, their natural language number uh, discourse, or they referred to completely different mathematical objects than we do when we say very familiar things like one plus one equals two. Um, in the next section, I'm gonna try to offer a reply on behalf of Linsky and Zalta that I don't think will work, but it, I think it's worth mentioning. Okay, so let's talk about the second problem for Linsky and Zalta's view. I think this is more original to me. I don't think Boijman made this um, but it's also something I'm less confident about. Okay. Um, so, I mean, here's a, here's a question worth asking. What does it take to author mathematical theory? What does that really amount to? I don't know for sure, but I suppose it amounts to laying out the axioms of the theory. Now, recall that one of the axioms of piano number theory, if you had all of them laid out, uh, you would see that one of them is this. Zero is a natural number. So when Dedekind and Piano, they didn't actually work together, right? But we're making some idealizations here. So when Dedekind and Piano were authoring P and T, um, they had to appeal to the predicate is a natural number, and they had to refer to zero in the very act of authoring the theory. Uh, in the paper version of what I'm presenting, I talk more about this predicate. Here, I just want to focus on the reference to zero thing. So. In more ordinary circumstances, when one is engaging in the speech act of baptizing a child or christening a ship, uh, the person doing the speech act has the ability to refer to the object being baptized pre-baptism. Okay, so what I mean is uh, in acts of baptizing something, as opposed to acts of authoring a mathematical theory, the person doing the baptism can reference the object being baptized without using that new name, right? You can point at the baby or you can look at the ship. They're in some sort of causal relation with the object to be baptized, such that there's no mystery surrounding their being able to refer to the not yet baptized object. Uh, they have that sort of familiar causal link with it. They can look at it or point at it. Um, however, how could one refer to zero in the act of authoring the theory in which zero serves as an object? Zero is not the sort of object we could point to or gaze at before authoring the theory in which it's supposed to be an object. Um, and right, I mean, as I mean, Nikolai just talked about what it means to be abstract, the, the abstract concrete distinction. But I mean, I, I take it the, the general view is that, look, mathematical objects are abstract. And part of that means they're a causal. Um, anyway, given that pre-theoretically, that is pre-authoring of piano number theory, zero could not be referred to, how could zero be referred to and employed in laying out the axioms, you know, that is in authoring piano number theory. That's my second problem. That's my more original problem. I think it's a good one. I'm not sure. But I, so the point is, I think Linsky and Zalta are, are caught in a vicious circle here, sort of temporal circle almost. Uh, and they can't appeal to the standard ways that we refer to not yet baptized objects, right, by looking at the baby, say. Okay. Um, I'll go through this quick. But potential responses. I want to offer um, two, I, I, one each, one potential response to each problem um, and see how far we can go. 
because I, I would like the Linsky and Zalta view to work kind of. Um, anyway, okay. So first, uh, here's a potential response on behalf of Linsky and Zalta to that first problem, the sort of problem identified by Boijman um, that I tried to strengthen. Uh, I take it that the continuity of natural number reference and natural language from the 19th to the 20th century is something that should be preserved, right? I, I take it that if we could, it would be a good thing to say that, um, actually uh, almost a mandatory thing to say that when people in 1840 said the number one, they were referring to the same thing that we're referring to now when I say one. Um, so here's a suggestion about how Linsky and Zalta Linsky and Zalta could, uh, could uh, maintain that continuity. Um, here's something they could say. Formal axiomatization is not the only way to author a mathematical theory. They could say that in the same way that not all fictional stories are a result of a single author publishing something, uh, not all mathematical theories are authored by just select group of mathematicians publishing papers with axiomatizations. Um, perhaps this sort of suggestion goes that I'm coming up with here, uh, there could be folk theories, folk mathematical theories in the same way that there are folk tales. If this is the case, then uh, people pre-Dedekind and pre-Piano did refer to the natural numbers or possibly referred to the natural numbers. Um, they referred to the natural numbers of the folk natural number theory pervasive in their culture. Call it F and T for folk number theory. This idea is that I'm, developing uh, here is while F and T was not axiomatized, it was the pervasive common background theory in all the conversational contexts that involved natural number discourse. So when someone uttered uh, one plus one equals two in 1886, they were referring to the object that encodes all the properties one does according to F and T. Uh, when pre-1887 people engaged in natural number discourse in their respective natural languages, determinate reference to the objects of F and T was fixed by F and T being the operative background mathematical theory in every national number like conversational context. That's the suggestion. I think it could be developed in different ways, but that's like the basics of it. Uh, but even then, I think the basics have problems, so we shouldn't accept it. Here are the problems. Um, I think they're problems, yeah. Um, so it's an empirical question whether every culture had the same F and T, for sure. It's also an empirical question whether say in Anglophone cultures, um, whether the F and T that existed before Dedekind and Piano there is the same as that theory they came up with. And more importantly, it's an empirical question whether any folk number theory ever existed anywhere at all. Um, skip a little bit. Um, unless, some historical mathematical research, I guess anthropological, uh, anthropological research in a way, can show that there was a definitive folk number theory operative in pre-Dedekind and piano cultures. Uh, then uh, unless the research shows that, then the, the, the original problem can't be solved, right? And unless, unless the empirical research says, look, there was a folk number theory that was sort of in everyone's minds in the culture and it matches, uh, the thing that Dedekind and Piano axiomatize, unless all that can be established, then we just were talking about different numbers on the Linsky Zalta view, and that's a bad thing. So I guess what I'm saying is Linsky and Zalta's view is hostage to a very almost incredible empirical uh, hypothesis. Okay, I, I'll, I'll end the problem with that. I'll end discussion of that problem with that one. Let me talk about um, response Linsky and Zalta could develop in light of my second critique, the, the vicious circle one. They might say this, go structuralist. This is definitely the section I'm thinking the most about. Uh, I'm not quite sure that I like what I have, but um, so here's what they could say. They could say, Dedekind and Piano, or right, we've just been focusing on natural numbers the whole time, but we could talk about any mathematical theory we wanted. That's not important. They could say that Dedekind and Piano uh, need not refer to some particular mathematical object zero in the act of authoring their theory. Instead, they just need an axiom like this. There's an initial element. This axiom doesn't talk about zero, so it doesn't get into the vicious circle trouble I've identified. Uh, I like this direction, but I'm worried how consistent it is with their wider project, right? They've repeatedly stressed that they're trying to get a view that delivers them reference to particular abstract objects, okay? So imagine a version of piano number theory 
properly structuralized, such as to avoid my vicious circle worry. Instead of zero as a natural number as an axiom, it has this as an axiom. There's an initial element. Call this new structuralized version of PNT, SPNT. Uh, one very serious problem with Linsky and Zalta say, uh, going this way is like, look, Dedekind and Piano didn't actually author SPNT. Despite, you know, Dedekind's structuralist leanings, um, they literally authored PNT. Um, so, I mean, like, I think that's enough to block Linsky and Zalta right here. But um, I want to let them bite the bullet and see how far we can go down this rabbit hole. Uh, I think it's a very serious bullet to bite. I don't think they can consistently bite this bullet. I think some spirit or letter of their view must change. But let's just say they... They, they, they say, oh, no, we were talking about SPNT the whole time and not PNT. Let's let them say that. Let's say, let them say all reference to natural numbers bottoms out in the authoring of SPNT. Here's another worry. I don't know if this one goes through, but uh, I'll share it. Here's another worry. Um, there's not one unique object that encodes the property of being an initial element of a structure. That means the SPNT axioms. So any object that is the initial element of an omega sequence would encode the relevant properties. Uh, to see what I'm trying to get out here, because uh, it might not be clear, uh, take uh, Piano's own actual two different axiomizations as a, as a case study. So according to this paper I found by this guy named Kennedy, uh, in 1889 and 1891, the sequence of natural numbers began with one, and the set of natural numbers was designated by, designated by n. This was modified in 1898 by Piano, so that the sequence began with zero. If Linsky and Zalta go with SPNT, then they would have no principled way of distinguishing between one and zero. One can start an omega sequence as much as zero can, or two even. Um, so this is all to say, appealing to SPNT over PNT won't save Linsky and Zalta from my vicious circle problem, I think, right? There might be ways of taking the dictum go structuralist in different ways, in which case my view here might not be correct, but I, I think it's on the right track. Um, yeah, so that's just summary. Yeah, okay, let me briefly summarize the whole thing, unless, yeah, uh, real quick. Um, so Linsky and Zalta, they want a view that lets them get determinate reference to um, um, mathematical objects. They develop their object theory to do so. Boijman asks, that's so complicated. Do normal people have to use definite descriptions to refer to numbers? Linsky and Zalta have a theory that connects lay people's reference to numbers to experts, which in turn is connected to the authorship. But I think that just makes two serious problems. One, it makes people before Dedekind Piano unable to refer to the same things we do. And second, it makes the, at least in some cases, at least in the case of PNT, it makes the authorship of the theory PNT dependent on prior reference to objects that are supposed to be able to be referred to after you make the theory, like zero. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thanks. Okay, Jason, thank you. And we have about two minutes for talk, for, for, for question. A pretty short question, in fact. Yes, I see Andre Weber wants to ask. Yes, please. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is just, uh, why is it an empirical question whether F and T exists because uh, you could say, um, if someone is able to talk about the number one, say, at all, he or she already has to have some concept in mind, a very, let's call it elementary folk number theory. And if they became better at mathematics, uh, the folk number theory becomes less elementary, it gets enriched and enriched. And during the centuries, it became an even more enriched theory until finally it reached its say ideal stage in piano number theory. So why can't we talk about a very elementary folk number theory and somewhat less elementary folk numbers theory and, uh, and so on. So lots of different stages um, that okay. developed during the centuries. And then it's clear that there has to be some such folk number theory in order for the people to be able at all to talk about numbers. Good. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I think there's something there. I guess I'm, I'm, I don't know if Linsky and Zalta could uh, accept that in the way that we might be thinking. 
because um, for them, theories are very strict sort of entities, right? Uh, that, that might not be the best word. They're very discreet. You couldn't have, you could have, like you said, different folk theories uh, sort of in, in a way improving on them throughout the generations or refining them throughout the generations or centuries. Um, but I think for Linsky and Zalta, any refinement, that means new theory. And so it means, it, it would still mean 18th century people say, are talking about different numbers than 19th century people say in 20th, even if your sort of anthropological, mathematical evolutionary story is right. For Linsky and Zalta, they would still have to say those are all different literal theories, so all different literal objects, I think. Thank you, though. Um, just okay. short Thank follow you. up, but isn't it yeah. the same problem in, for example, biology, where we have to, uh, or where we talk about concrete objects? If I found a new kind of plant and I just give it and give a name to it, and then later on people found out much more about how this plant uh, behaves or what its properties are, in a way we have a new theory about that plant as well. Um, so it, it doesn't seem special for uh, abstract objects, right? I, I think it. I think it is special. Um, mm. If we're if we're adopting if we're if we're already adopting the Linsky and Zalta view, mm. then change of theory must always imply change of object. Mm. Whereas, I mean, I guess this is up for debate. But with concrete objects, I feel like you might change your beliefs about the relevant concrete object, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean you're talking about a different object. I think the way that their object theory is set up, these mm -hmm. axioms and stuff, it makes it such that if you talk about a different theory, then you must be talking about a different object. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so, thank you. So, yeah, okay.